Hi, my name is John Cornicello, and I want to help you learn about photography. I usually talk about studio lighting topics, but today I want to focus on lenses. But first, let's make sure your camera's viewfinder is in focus. Most cameras have a diopter adjustment controlled by the viewfinder. Use this to make sure the viewfinder is in focus. Put your lens into manual focus mode. Point the camera at a plain white wall. Defocus the lens as much as you can. Then adjust the diopter until the information in the viewfinder is sharp and clear. So, on to lenses. Lenses are something we kind of take for granted. Our cameras are pretty much useless without a lens, but just what does a lens do? It collects and bends light to project an image onto a surface, usually film or a digital sensor, but there is more to it than that. The most basic lens is a pinhole, but that is dim and soft. To make sharp images, we use lenses with multiple glass or plastic elements. But what do we really know about lenses, and how much of that knowledge we have is correct? Let's start with describing the characteristics of a photographic lens. The most common way we describe a lens is by its focal length, such as 24mm, 50mm, or 300mm, as we see here. They are also described by the relative focal length, such as short, wide, normal, long, or telephoto. Prime lenses have a fixed focal length such as those mentioned, while zoom lenses offer a range of focal lengths such as 24 to 70, 70 to 200, 100 to 400, and on. There are two types of zoom lenses. Power focal lenses stay in focus as you zoom in and out, and very focal lenses need to be refocused when changing focal length. Unfortunately, I don't recall any manufacturers listing what kind of zooms they offer. What is focal length? I want to avoid math and formulas and fractions and keep things pretty simple here. Focal length is the distance between the optical center or rear nodal point of the lens and the film plane when focused at infinity. In terms of lenses, infinity is the distance from which light enters the lens in parallel rays. Focal length is a given for a particular lens and fixed in manufacturing. You cannot change it discounting zoom lenses, but you can use accessories to alter the focal length. More on those later. Next question is, what does focal length do? Focal length controls the magnification of the subject. Longer lenses project a larger subject and therefore capture a narrower field of view. That is, they look taken less of the scene. Shorter lenses capture a wider field of view as they provide lower magnification of the subject. Changing the focal length, either by changing lenses or by using a zoom lens from the same camera position, alters the size of the subject in the frame but it does not change the perspective. Switching to a longer lens is basically a pre-production cropping in camera as opposed to cropping in on an existing photo during the post-production phase. The sizes of objects in the scene scale equally and maintain the same relationship to each other. If on the other hand you move the camera in closer, the objects closer to the camera will get larger much faster than objects behind them, changing their size relationship or perspective. I will come back to perspective later in this presentation. I mentioned normal, short, and long lenses. What do those terms mean? A normal lens approximates the perspective that our eyes take in. That is the size relationship between the objects in the scene. And a normal lens takes in about the area of a scene that we pay attention to. Our eyes do take in a much wider field of view than a normal lens, but most of that is our peripheral vision and not really paid much attention to. A short lens lets you get in close to a subject and takes in a wider field of view. This is useful when you cannot move back away from your subject, such as being in a small room. Being in close can cause perspective issues that I will come back to. I hesitate to call it distortion because in lens terms, distortion is a specific condition where the corners of an image pull out, called pincushion distortion, or where the corners pull in, called barrel distortion. The perspective issue with being in close is that the objects appear to be spaced more apart than they actually are with an exaggerated size relationship. Whatever is closer to the lens is much larger than elements farther from the lens. In portraits taken from too close to your subject, their nose is relatively much closer to the lens than the eyes are, so the nose looks large. As you move back from the subject, the relative distance changes and the nose and eyes become about the same distance from the camera and look more normal. Moving even farther back flattens out the face and can make it look wider. 
None of this is caused by the lens, but a short lens tempts you to and lets you get in closer to your subject and change that perspective. On the other hand, a long lens brings things closer to you. Long lenses can be used when you can't get closer, such as photographing a sporting event where you cannot get on the field with the players, or used when you don't want to get closer to a subject, such as photographing wild animals out in the field. Long lenses are good for isolating a subject. Their narrow view eliminates clutter surrounding your subject, and the higher magnification makes the background blurry and more abstract. Opposite of moving in close and making objects look further apart than they actually are, by allowing you to move back farther from the subject, you now make the objects in the scene look closer than they are. This is often called telephoto compression, but the focal length and lens design have nothing to do with the compression. That comes from the greater distance between the camera and the subject. The long lens is then selected to magnify the central area of the scene. For the sake of completeness, I should mention that all long lenses are not telephoto lenses. A telephoto lens is one whose physical length is shorter than its actual focal length due to the design of the lens. That's the theory, but in practice everyone calls long lenses telephoto. You might now be asking why we have different focal length lenses. Having different focal lengths allows the photographer to work at different camera to subject distances. I just mentioned the most obvious situations where you cannot get close to your subject, photographing a sporting event or photographing animals in the wild where you want to be at a distance for safety. At the other end of the spectrum, you might have to use a short lens because there's no room to back up away from your subject. The less obvious but more important reason for different focal length lenses is to give you the choice of where to position your camera in relation to, to your subject for control over the perspective of the scene. I make an analogy between a lens and a wrench. They come in different sizes and you use the one that fits the situation. Zoom lenses are like adjustable wrenches. As Ansel Adams said, a good photograph is knowing where to stand. If you have been researching which lens to purchase, you have probably run across specifications listing an effective focal length. This can be confusing. Focal length is focal length. How can there be two focal lengths listed for one lens? This is because film and digital image sensors come in a variety of sizes, as you see here. The industry has settled on the full-frame 35mm system as the base of comparison. So the real focal length is listed for the 35mm full-frame sensor. If your camera has a smaller sensor, like a micro four-thirds or an APS-C size, it will capture less of the scene at the same viewpoint as the camera with the larger sensor. So it appears that you're effectively, but not really, using a longer lens. Crop factor sensors do not increase the focal length of a lens. The focal length is intrinsic to the lens and doesn't care what size sensor it is projecting onto. What is affected is the field of view. A smaller sensor takes in a narrower field of view at the same focal length. When combined with the sensor size, we find out the field of view, which is the part of the scene that is captured on a given sensor size. If your camera sensor is half the size of a full frame, uh, we say it has a 2x effect. So a 50mm lens on that camera would have the field of view of a 100mm full frame. The lens might be marked as 50mm or it might be marked as a 100mm equivalent. Medium format cameras have larger sensors than the 35mm. So with them you get a wider field of view from the same focal length. But from the same camera position, the area of the scene that is common to both will be the same size. There are lenses designed for specific sensor sizes. Part of the design is how big an image circle they project. To keep size and cost down, lenses for smaller formats project a smaller image circle. You cannot simply put any lens on any camera. Besides the obvious different mounts for each brand of camera, if you try to use a lens designed for a small sensor on a larger camera, you will run into a big problem with vignetting as the image circle is smaller than the sensor. You can use a lens designed for a full frame on a smaller sensor camera, but you cannot use a lens designed for a small sensor on a larger sensor camera. Perspective is the size relationship between objects in a scene. We judge depth by comparing the size of known objects. Think of a long robe with telephone poles spaced out along it. We know that the poles are the same size, but the ones closer to us look larger and farther apart. The poles in the distance look smaller and closer together. Train tracks do the same thing. 
The rails converge in the distance with the spacing between the ties becoming narrower as they're farther away. Here we see the guardrail on a bridge. We know that the posts are the same size even though they get smaller in the distance. I find it interesting that we readily accept a photo showing this perspective trailing off towards the horizon. But when we see an image looking up at a building showing the same perspective with the building narrowing towards the top, it makes us feel like the building is falling away from us. There is a common misconception that the lens in use affects the perspective in a photograph. But perspective is actually determined by the camera to subject distance or viewpoint. It is not affected by the focal length of the lens. From the same camera position or viewpoint, short lenses take in more of the scene with the subject or subjects being more smaller in the frame. Here are two photos of the same scene made with a 24mm lens and with a 105mm lens from the same camera position. If I crop the 24mm image to the same framing as the 105, we see that the perspective is the same. A longer lens at the same position gives us a narrower field of view, making the subject larger. But with either extreme, the size relationship between the objects in the scene remains the same if the camera position is not changed. You can take two photos made from the same camera position with a short and with a long lens, crop them to the same framing, and see the same compression in the area of the photos that is common to both photos. At first, the two photos might look the same, but there are differences. The depth of field will be deeper in the cropped 24mm image, and you have to enlarge the crop of the wide shot quite a bit, losing a lot of resolution to get the same framing. Basically, a long lens gives the same visual effect as cropping a photo in post-production, but keeps the original quality instead of having to make a big enlargement at the cost of resolution to get the framing you desire. Here you see it in action. I start with a 100mm image, which is hidden on a layer beneath a 400mm image. As I shrink the 400 image down, you see the 100 image behind it, and eventually they come down to the same perspective when the framing is the same. To recap, perspective is the way things appear to the eye based on their positions and the distances from each other. The takeaways here are that perspective is independent of the focal length of the lens. The size of the image will be approximately proportional to the focal length, and from a fixed camera position, changing focal length will not change perspective. Further complicating all this is print viewing distance. To get a normal view, you need to view a photograph from its perspective point so the eye has the same relationship to objects in the photo that the lens had in the original scene. The perspective point for a negative slide or image sensor is the distance of the focal length. When viewing an enlargement, the perspective distance is the lens focal length times the degree of enlargement. As an example, take an 8x10 print from a 35mm camera with its 1x1.5 inch sensor and made with a 50mm lens. The enlargement factor is about 8 times. 8 times 50 millimeters is about 16 inches so the print should be viewed from 16 inches away to see the proper perspective. If the photo is made with a 14 millimeter lens, an 8x10 print should then be viewed from 8 times 14 millimeters, or only about 4.5 inches away to see the proper perspective. You might be asking just what is a normal lens? It is a lens that produces a photo that, when viewed at a normal distance, puts the eye at the perspective point. The focal length of a normal lens is determined by the diagonal length of the sensor, which gives a similar angle of view to the human eye. For a 35mm 1x1.5-inch sensor, the diagonal is about 43mm and the diagonal field of view is 53 degrees. In practice, anything from 40 millimeters to 60 millimeters is considered normal for a full frame 35 millimeter camera. Different sizes of film or sensors call for different focal lengths to be considered normal. Small prints up to about 11 by 14 or so when held in our hands are usually viewed from about 10 to 20 inches away no matter what focal length was used to make the photo. Photos on a gallery wall are usually viewed all from the same distance.
And how often does a viewer even know what focal length lens was used? They just see so-called wide-angle distortions when they view the photo from too far away, or they see a compressed or flattened image when the photo is viewed from too close. 35mm camera photos made with lenses shorter than 43mm are often called out for odd perspective because they are rarely viewed from the perspective point. The larger a print that is made from a negative photograph with a short lens, the more normal the perspective will look. This is because the larger photo will typically be viewed from farther away. Remember I said that an 8x10 made with a 14mm lens should be viewed from about 4.5 inches away. But if instead the print size was 80 by 100 inches, the viewing distance would be about 4 feet away. This gets complicated by the use of zoom lenses. From the same camera position, the perspective of the image doesn't change as you zoom in or out, but the perspective point, the distance you should view the image from, does change. Oh, and did I mention that smaller images should be viewed with only one eye, not both? As I mentioned before, we need to be careful when talking about distortion. To a lens designer, distortion is a particular effect where either the corners of a photo pull out, called pincushion distortion, or the corners pull in, called barrel distortion. A fisheye lens takes advantage of barrel distortion to an extreme to give it a signature look. Photographers, on the other hand, call a variety of effects distortion. These might include people, or in this case tennis balls, on the end of a group photos getting stretched out of shape, or a tall building appearing to be leaning backwards, or the nose of a subject being too large, or a compression of the scene. But each of these issues comes not from the lens, but from the camera position. Here are photos of the same building made with the same lens from the same level, but at different distances. Wide angle distortion where things are stretched out at the end of either side of a photo, is perspective or viewpoint distortion. You are simply too close to your subject. Many issues with short lenses can be narrowed down to working at the wrong camera to subject distance. A well-known issue is what happens to people on the ends of a group photo that was made with a short lens. They get stretched out of shape. Is the lens that is doing that? What is happening is that the lens sees both the front and the sides of those unfortunate folks on the ends and renders them stretched out. This only happens with 3D subjects, and the cure is to move back away from the group and then either crop in post-production or use a longer lens to fill the frame. Take a look at these tennis balls. There are two balls in one photo of a ball. The ball in the center is round. The ball in the lower left is obviously stretched out but the photo of a ball in the upper left corner shows no sign of stretching, even though it is in the corner of a photo made with a very wide angle lens. Let's work through this. Here I have three tennis balls, photographed from about three inches or eight centimeters away with a 15 millimeter lens. The center ball is round as expected, but the end balls have taken on an elongated shape. Keeping the same 15mm lens, I move the camera back and of course get much more of the scene in the frame. If I now crop in on this photo, we notice that the balls on the end are not as elongated as they were before. The extra distance cured that, but the resolution is now low from the extreme crop. So when I move back, instead of cropping in post, I can use a longer lens to fill the frame. Here are the tennis balls photographed with a 105mm lens. The same thing happens on a larger scale, for instance with a row of columns. Here we have two scenes. On the left is a flat image, it might be a photograph or a drawing, of three green columns with the camera at a wide angle lens in close. All of the columns are projected to the same width on the sensor. On the right we have three dimensional balls photographed with the same camera, lens and distance. The balls on the ends are projected wider than actual. Now, if we back the camera up, the balls are now projected in closer proportion to their actual size. Of course, they are smaller in the frame, so you neither need to crop in the image or use a longer lens to fill the frame. For people photographers, here are three heads side by side, all facing straight ahead, though it sure doesn't look like it when you're only 12 inches or 30 centimeters away from them. Let's see what happens when we move back with the same lens to 48 inches, about 115 centimeters, and then switch to the 50 millimeter lens, and then crop the 15 millimeter lens to match the 50 millimeter version. I am certain that you have seen comparison photos like these, 
They usually accompany an article about what a different focal length lens does to a face in a portrait. It will show a series of photographs made with different focal length lenses that show radically different drawings of the face. The problem with these comparisons is that both of these photos here were made with the same lens, a 15 millimeter. The one on the left from about a foot away and the one on the right from about four feet away. What most of the so-called lens comparison demonstrations show is actually what happens at different camera to subject distances. Here's a series of portraits made with the same lens at different distances. The photos are then all cropped to the same framing and you see the perspective change even though this lens hasn't changed. Next up is a series made with different focal length lenses at the same camera position and cropped to the same framing to show the same perspective. If one lens focal length is used but the camera to subject distance is changed, the perspective then changes. With the camera in close, the objects in the background look smaller or more distant from each other. With the camera farther away, the background objects look larger or closer to each other. When the camera position remains the same and the focal length is changed, the perspective remains the same. I want to make it clear that from the same camera viewpoint, changing the focal length of the lens is akin to cropping the image. If the camera remains in the same position, there is no change in perspective when you change focal length. Focal length determines the magnification or the size of the subject in the frame. This image was made with a 50 millimeter lens with the camera positioned 48 inches from the glass in front. The glass in back is 10 inches behind the front glass, and the glasses will not be moved between the images on the following slides. Changing to a 100 millimeter lens without moving the camera, everything in the scene becomes twice as large as with the 50 millimeter. That is, everything scales up in the same proportion, maintaining their size relationships. If we crop the 50 millimeter image to the same framing as the 100 millimeter and put them side by side as I've done here, they look the same except for the greater depth of field in the cropped image. The color arrows here show the sizes of the background, the glasses, and the space between the glasses. Duplicating the arrows, you can see that the size and relationships between all the objects in the scene are the same with the different length lenses. If I move the camera with the 50 millimeter into half the distance, 24 inches away, to fill the frame the same way with the front glass, now the perspective or size relationship between the objects in the scene changes. Side by side, we see the differences. The glass in front remains the same height, but the glass in the back looks smaller and both appear to be thinner. Let's bring the arrows back. This time when I duplicate them onto the second image, you can see some dramatic changes in the size relationships. The glass in front is the same size because we have the focal length and the camera to subject distance. Everything else changed. Another thing you can see here is how the background paper appears wider when the camera is farther away from the set. If you find yourself running out of background, you can sometimes move back farther from the subject to gain a bit of width in the background. Here we see the images made with the same lens at different distances. The difference is due to the distance, not the focal length. The effect is much more pronounced in a photograph than with the naked eye, as can be seen here in these simulations. Here I am using two recognizable objects, the moon and the Seattle Space Needle. If we were able to get close to the needle with a normal lens, the needle would be large in the photo, with the moon being small and off in the distance. If we then back up from the needle, the perspective changes. Let's assume I backed up to 12 times the distance. Keeping the same lens on the camera, the needle now looks like it's 12 times farther away, because it is. But the moon is relatively the same distance it was when we were close to the needle. Our brain knows the moon isn't any closer, so we see it as being larger. Now if I switch to a 600 millimeter lens, which is 12 times as powerful as the 50, it magnifies a portion of the scene 12 times, as if the 50 millimeter lens was used at its original distance. 
and now the moon looks like it's 12 times larger than it was before. Here is another series of photos made of the Space Needle, this time made from an office building about a half mile from the needle. As you get off the elevator at the end of a hallway leading to a window that looks out at the Space Needle, the needle fills the window. But as you walk down the hall getting closer to the window, the needle appears to get smaller or to be farther away. Here are three photos made with the same lens, first at the end of the hall far from the window, then closer to the window, and then right at the window. Of course the needle is not shrinking or moving. What is happening is that the window becomes larger in your field of vision because you are much closer to it, while the distance between you and the needle hasn't changed in any significant way, so the needle remains the same size. If I made the middle image with both a 24 and a 105 millimeter as I did, and then cropped the photos from each lens to the same framing, the perspective is the same. People often blame the lens for perspective because a shorter lens not only attempts us to move in closer, but it allows us to move closer and focus in closer to expand the perspective. And a long lens is more likely to be used at a greater distance or even forces you to move back because of the narrower field of view and not being able to focus on closer subjects. Remember, the closer the camera is to the subject, the smaller the background elements will appear and the scene will look expanded in depth. Here's an easy exercise. Take an object of known size, a large coin will do, and hold it between your thumb and forefinger. Close one eye and hold the coin about three inches in front of your open eye. Look at the coin and at an object across the room. The coin appears large compared to that distant object. Now extend your arm out to hold the coin as far away as from your eye as you can. The coin gets smaller while the distant object remains the same size. If we photographed it, it would look like the coin remained the same size and the background image got larger. Can you zoom with your feet? Advice to new photographers and old often includes the phrase, zoom with your feet. The advice is well-intentioned, suggesting that the photographer move around to find the right framing for their subject, but it is misleading because you cannot zoom with your feet. Zooming assumes a stationary camera position, where as you zoom in and out, the size relationship between the elements of the scene remains constant. Again, you are just cropping. Once you move your feet, you are changing your view of the world. This is called the dolly move. Once you find that new viewpoint where you can go ahead and zoom in or out to get the framing you want, so don't let the lens dictate where you have to stand. When changing the focal length of the lens from a fixed camera position, the magnification of the objects in the scene changes, but the relationship between the objects stays the same. Note the relationship between the word perspective and the subject's neck, and between the subject and the other subjects behind. When zooming in and out, they do not move in relationship to each other. When the camera position is moved, the perspective, the relationship between the elements in the scene changes. When moving in closer, the object closest to the camera increases in size rapidly, while the background elements remain virtually the same size. Depth of field is the region of a scene, from foreground to background, that is acceptably sharp. A lens, be it our eye or one attached to a camera, can only focus on one plane of a scene. We don't notice this so much with our eyes, because our eyes are able to quickly scan a scene and are constantly refocusing. But in a photograph, everything in front of or beyond the focus plane is out of focus and gets projected as a circle instead of a point. There is a threshold in our vision where below a certain size, these small blur circles, called circles of confusion, look like points and appear in focus. This is where we get depth of field. 
Here we can see that when the lens aperture is wide open, the image is projected from a wide area onto the sensor. When the lens gets stopped down, the angle of coverage gets narrower and more of the circles of confusion are small enough to be seen as being in focus. Depth of field is an aesthetic decision and can be shallow or deep. There isn't a good or bad depth of field. It depends on what you want in the photograph. The start and end of the region is gradual, not a hard line in or out of focus. Depth of field is controlled by the f-stop that the lens is set to and the magnification of the scene on the image sensor, and that is the combination of the focal length and the camera to subject distance. It is also affected by the distance a print is viewed from. A wall-sized print could look sharp from 20 to 30 feet or 7 to 8 meters away, but it won't be sharp viewed up close. Contrary to a very popular belief, the focal length of a lens is not a factor in depth of field, except that, from the same camera position, a short lens will give more depth of field than a longer lens, but the short lens is also providing a much smaller subject in the frame. To make the subject larger, you can crop in on the photo from the short lens with a loss of resolution, or you can move in closer to fill the frame. Here are two photos made with a 50mm lens and a 130mm lens from the same camera position. The 50mm photo has more depth of field, as you can see in the leaves, but they are smaller. When I enlarge the 50mm lens to match the 130mm photo, you see that the depth of field is still greater with the shorter lens, but the resolution is lost. If I had moved in closer with the 50mm lens to make the front tube the same size as with the 130mm lens, two things would show. First, the leaves in the background would be as blurry in both, but the receding tubes in that pile of leaves would be much smaller. Remember our perspective section. The closer the camera is to the subject, the smaller the background elements will appear. Yes, most depth of field calculators do ask for the focal length of the lens, but they also ask for the camera to subject distance. Those combine to tell you the subject magnification, and that is a determining factor along with the f-stop. As a general rule, when the image size on the camera sensor or film is the same size, the depth of field is the same at any given f-stop. You will often hear it said that depth of field extends one-third in front of and two-thirds behind the focus plane. This does hold true at some focusing distances, but it's not an absolute. When you get closer to the subject, as in macro photography, the depth of field tends to be more equal in front of and behind the point focused on. One of my pet peeves is when I hear people say depth of focus when they really mean depth of field, or they just interweave them both when talking about depth of field. As we have seen, depth of field happens outside the camera at the subject plane. Depth of focus, on the other hand, happens inside the camera and is more about the precision needed in manufacturing the camera. It is the range or distance that the sensor can be in front of or behind the focal plane and still maintain focus. So please stop using the term when you really mean depth of field. At some point you might be asking why lenses have a minimum focusing distance. In the world of 35mm film or digital, our normal 50mm lens can usually focus into about 18 to 20 inches or 45 to 50 centimeters away. There are a few reasons for this. First relates to the aberration corrections in the lens. Standard, non-macro lenses are aberration corrected for distant subjects from infinity to about 10 times the focal length distance. You will notice that the minimum focusing distance for many standard lenses is about 10 times their focal length. Standard lenses are also designed to record three-dimensional objects at a certain magnification and macro lenses need to reproduce flat objects perpendicular to the optical axis. So corrections for curvature of field different between standard and macro lenses. Reverse mounting a standard lens usually provides better optical performance for close-up work, but modern autofocus lenses are not always easy to reverse mount and still be able to stop down the lens. If you need to work in closer, there are macro lenses that let you focus into at least a one-to-one -one reproduction ratio. This is where the subject is the same size on the sensor as it is in real life. Some macro lenses offer even greater magnification. Macro lenses are designed with the intent of being used in close and have different aberration corrections such as curvature of field than a non-macro lens, though many photographers do use a macro lens in place of a standard lens.
Remember that we said the focal length was the distance from the rear nodal point of the lens to the film plane when focused at infinity. As you focus on closer subjects, the lens has to be extended out farther from the film plane. This means that the light has to travel farther within the lens so less light reaches the sensor, so the actual F number and the marked F number deviate from each other as you focus on closer subjects. At distances closer than about 10 times the focal length of the lens, this light loss is significant. Regular in-camera metering through the lens would automatically adjust for this loss of light. But if you're using a handheld external meter or off-camera flash, this needs to be compensated for. So it is convenient to make the close focusing distance of a lens about 10 times its focal length. This is also why cinema lenses are marked in T-stops for the actual transmission value of the light coming through the lens and taking into account various situations that reduce the light and deviate from the marked F-stop. As mentioned, a macro lens lets you focus in at 1 to 1 reproduction ratio or higher. For example, Canon has a lens that only works from 1 to 1 to 5 to 1 and cannot be used at normal working distances. Confusion abounds because there are many lenses that have macro in their name or description but do not let you get into 1 to 1 reproduction ratios. They should be described as close focusing with a macro reserve for 1 to 1 or greater magnification, but that ship sailed years ago. If the reproduction size and depth of field are the same with different macro lenses, why are there different focal length lenses? It comes down to working distance and perspective. With the longer 150mm to 200mm macro lenses, they are used farther away from the subject, so it will be less of an issue when working with live subjects such as insects. And having a greater working distance also allows you to get some light on the subject. And with the longer focal length, you will be able to see less of the background. When you get into the super macro lenses like the Canon 65mm or the 20mm 4.5 to 1 lens pictured in a previous slide, the background isn't as much of a concern. Another characteristic of a lens is its maximum aperture or f-stop, which denotes the speed of a lens. A lens that has a large wide aperture like f1.4 is considered faster than a lens with a smaller maximum aperture like f4. So what is the aperture and what do those numbers mean? The aperture size is described in f-stops. This comes from comparing the lens focal length with the diameter of the aperture opening. A 100mm lens with a 25mm diameter aperture is f4. 100 divided by 25 equals 4. A 100mm f2 lens has a maximum aperture of 100 divided by 2 or 50mm, making the lens larger, heavier, and more expensive. But the f2 lens lets in two stops or four times more light than the f4 lens and allows us to get shallower depth of field. The usual f-stop progression on lenses is f1, 1.4, 2, 2.8, 4, 5.6, 8, 11, 16, 22, 32, and on. Each of these numbers is 1.4 times the previous number. 1.4 is the square root of 2, and I'll leave it at that, as I promise no math. Most cameras can be set to show half or third stop increments, which you see listed here. If you are wondering why smaller numbers describe a larger opening, it is because these are actually fractions. F equals 1 over 1, or 1 over 2, or 1 over 4. Half a pizza is larger than a quarter of a pizza, which is larger than an eighth of a pizza. The aperture in the lens is in the form of an iris with multiple blades that can vary the size of the opening. Wide open, the aperture is round. But depending on the number of blades, as you stop down, the shape can change to a triangle with three blades, to a pentagon with five blades, a hexagon with six blades, and more and more close to a round shape with more and more blades. The shape of the aperture affects the look of the out-of-focus areas of a photo that people call the bouquet of the lens. The more round the shape typically provides a more pleasing look to the out-of-focus areas of the photograph. Prime lenses, that is non-zoom lenses, have a maximum aperture that doesn't change. Zoom lenses can have either a constant fixed speed or a variable maximum aperture. A 70-200 f2.8 lens offers f2.8 at all of its focal lengths, 
A 100 to 400 millimeter f4.5 to f6.3 lens offers f4.5 at its shortest end, but slows down to f6.3 at its long end. Fixed aperture zoom lenses are generally more expensive and larger and heavier than the variable aperture lens with the same focal length range. Bigger apertures let in more light, but provide less depth of field. They are good for isolating the subject by blurring the background. Smaller apertures provide greater depth of field for those times you need to get more into the scene in focus. So you would think that stopping the lens down to f16 or f22 would give the best image as more of the scene would be in focus. But smaller apertures can cause a problem called diffraction. That is the light rays are disturbed as they pass through a small aperture. Think of what happens when you put your thumb over the end of a garden hose to make the smooth water flow start spraying out more randomly. One form of diffraction is a blurring of the image, and the other is a star pattern or diffraction spikes made by small bright lights when photographed with the lens stopped down. You might find it interesting that an aperture with an even number of blades makes a star with the same number of spikes as there are blades. An aperture with an odd number of blades will make a star with twice as many spikes as there are blades. The lens used here, a Sigma 180mm macro lens, has 9 aperture blades producing 18 diffraction spikes. With a 35mm full frame sensor camera, try to stay at f11 or wider to avoid diffraction. On cameras with smaller sensors, f8 is the practical limit to avoid diffraction. Larger apertures let you use faster shutter speeds to help freeze motion, while smaller apertures may require the use of a tripod to avoid camera shake. Some lenses have a feature called image stabilization or vibration compensation to help steady the camera, but neither a tripod nor IS will help freeze the subject movement. More and more cameras are now also offering in-body stabilizations, but that too only helps prevent camera shake with no effect on the subject movement. Earlier, I mentioned attachments that can alter the focal length of a lens. The most common are teleconverters that go between the lens and the camera, which increase the magnification by enlarging the image, extension tubes that go between the lens and the camera, but are hollow tubes that allow the lens to focus in on subjects close to them without the tubes, and close-up lenses that attach to the front of the lens and also allow for closer focusing. Teleconverters usually come in powers of 1.4 or 2. They enlarge the image either 1.4 or 2 times the, at the cost of 1 stop with the 1.4x and 2 stops with the 2x. However, they maintain the same close focusing distance and allow infinity focus. Extension tubes come in various sizes too, such as 12mm and 24mm. As noted, there is no glass in them. They simply extend the lens farther from the sensor to allow focusing in closer. They do prevent the lens from being able to focus on distant objects. Be careful of purchasing extension tubes. Cheaper ones often do not have any electrical contacts in them, so they can't allow the camera to communicate with the lens, so there is no autofocus and no control over f-stop, for example. Close-up lenses come in various powers called diopters. Usually they are plus 1, plus 2, plus 3, maybe even up to plus 10. These attach to the front of the lens like a filter and again allow closer focusing but prevent focusing on distant objects, but this time without the light loss. Most are a single element lens and suffer image quality around the edges of the frame, but there are better quality two element close-up lenses such as the Canon 500D lenses. I am not a big fan of filters like UV and others designed for protection of the lens. I always have a lens hood on any lens that I use that has a hood available. Besides the job of blocking lateral light from striking the lens and causing flare, the hood can act as a shock absorber if you bang the lens into something while carrying it. The front element of a camera is, the lens is usually very thick and not likely to crack from getting bumped. Filter glass is very thin and more likely to break from the minor bump and that raises the possibility of the filter shattering and damaging the lens with shards of glass. I've had friends show me their cracked filters as proof of protection, but I highly doubt that the front element would have shattered from the impact that shattered the filter. Additionally, any air to glass surface raises the chance for flare and odd reflections in the photos, 
This is especially true because the filter was not a consideration in the design of the lens and in the construction and might not have the multi-coating that lens elements have to restrict flare and increase trans light transmission. And also take a look at the refraction going on here. Let's recap some of the things touched on here. When the subject is the same size in the frame, the depth of field is the same with any focal length lens at any given f number. Here is a photo made with a short lens, a 35mm at f4. Here is the same scene made with a longer lens, 135mm, with a subject a similar size in the frame, also at f4. Note that the depth of field is the same in each despite the very different focal lengths used. The size relationship between the head and the eye chart does change though, leading to the next item. When the camera is in closer to the subject, the background appears smaller or expanded. When the camera is farther away from the subject, the background appears larger or compressed. The 35mm photo is taken from in close to the mannequin and the chart looks smaller farther away. The 135mm photo is taken from farther away to maintain the same size of the head. Although the distance from the head to the chart is not changed, the size relationship between them did. From farther away, the chart looks like it is closer or larger. Here is another example. The 90, 105, and 180 millimeter lenses all show the same depth of field at 1 to 1 magnification at f4 or at f22. But the 180 millimeter is farther away from the matchsticks, making the background appear larger, and you can see fewer of the color bands behind the matches. Different focal length lenses from the same camera position show the same perspective. These images were made from the same position with a wide, a normal, and a short lens. Notice that the relationship between the sculpture and the space needle remains the same. Focal length determines the magnification of the subject and how far you are from the subject. Different camera to subject distances give you control over perspective. Different focal lengths let us work at different distances to give us the different perspectives. Find the camera to subject distance and viewpoint for the look you want. Then pick the lens that fills the frame as you want. Don't let the lens dictate where to stand. You are responsible for the content of the frame and how the elements relate to each other. Photograph with intention. Don't blame the lens. Again, my name is John Cornicello and I am here to help you learn about photography. Thank you for watching and please check out some of my photo conversations and other educational content here on YouTube. Thank you.